Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Sticks and stones may break my bones. Hey guys, uh, how you doing? Um, I'm gonna go kind of caught me in a bad moment. I was trying to test the fear. You know what? Let's just get started. Words. Yeah. Today we're talking about words. I know. It's a big deal about words. Well, they're a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> words are a big deal, right? Words are such a big deal because they hold power. I'll present to you a couple of examples today. All right, I feel like I'm like, I feel like I'm like setting out a thesis, but I'm not, right? I just wanna have a talk with you guys. Words, so here's the thing about words. They're transformative. And for those who have authority, it can change reality. And I know that kind of sounds abstract and philosophical, but let's go into a small example first. You're at a subway, please don't sue me. You're at a subway, right? And you ask the cut. You ask the the, the the what are they called? Uh, the people, who, employees. <laughs> you ask the employee for something, right? Uh, can I get a sandwich, right? The, the, the employee gives you the sandwich. Why? Because there's an exchange. There's authority. Your actions have, you know, consequences. Your words have authority, right? So let's say the the employee didn't give you the sandwich. So what happens then, right? Oh, you know, you go, you um, you know, you make a big fuss about it. If you're one of those people, you make a fuss about it. You complain. You go to management, or worse, since we're in the 21st century, you go on Yelp and you leave a one-star review, and no one eats there again. You ruined it for everyone, didn't? You? So moving on, right? So now you have, now I'm gonna present to you another example. You have a civilian, right? And you know, you have someone, random person, let's say me, and I go to you and I say, you're under arrest. You're A, gonna look at me like I have four heads, or B, you're gonna straight up laugh in my face, right? Straight up, you're just gonna laugh in my face. Why? Because I don't possess that authority, right? Versus if a police officer with authority tells you that you're under arrest, whether you like it or not, you comply or you face the consequences, right? Wait, hold up. Can we be on these rocks? Huh? Can we be on these rocks? Yeah, why not? All right. Why, um, are they looking at us for No, I'm just wondering in case a cop comes by. No, no, no. Don't worry about it. I got my permit. All right. So what's all this talk about words? Like, why are words important? Well, aren't you impatient? Fine. Let's talk about words. Let's keep on talking about words, right? So let's move up the chain of authority. So you have civilian to customer, right? Yet, you know, us as normal people without a title, we have minimal authority, right? Cops have some authority, right? Because they're authorized, right? We move up. Now, who is the most powerful person in the world? Survey says Armando. Obama. The United States president, yes. But we're not in 2016, or 15, or 14, or 13, or 12, or 11, or 10, or 9, or 8, or 8. He was elected in 8. He was elected in 8. He was inaugurated in 9. Inaugurated? Did I say that right? Yeah, inaugurated. Okay. Okay. So. I don't think that was right. No, Whatever. I think Whatever. you got it. I mean, you I, got I, I it, though. I, yeah. Yeah, I think you're fine. I think you're good. Okay, so, right? So, the president holds authority over the rest, right? He holds authority over the world. Why? Because of the authority that's already given to him. Not only by the people, but his mil the military behind him, how much, economic po how much of an economic powerhouse the United States is, and in general, just how much influence the United States has. In fact, the language of diplomacy is English. That's, that's, that's a fact, right? If Russia would've won the Cold War, it would've been Russian. But guess what? America. But continuing on that point, right? Continuing on to that point, what, there's an authority higher than this world. Now, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Well, 
let's go beyond our capacity. What if I were to say that there's a higher authority than the authority that's in this world today? That is which we call God, right? Put them right here. God, right? So, when we speak about God, first, before we even talk about God, let's define, let's define, let's, let's use the definition that I'm talking about, God. Here's, here's some pages, here's some links, and here's, you know, my, my boy Thomas Aquinas. Before we get into, you know, God, I first want to quali qualify, what I first want to clarify what I mean when we're talking about God, right? The unactualized actually actualizer, the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover, right? When we're talking about God, we're speaking about someone who is beyond the universe, someone who created, who put stuff into motion, who created space and time, but yet it's not a part, it's not enforced, I mean, it's not trapped by that space and time like we are, right? So we as human beings are caught under this value of space and time. Not God. God is work, works beyond it, right? God is not bound by space and time because he created it. The same way if I create a chair, the chair doesn't tell me what to do. I tell the chair what to do. Hashtag I hate chairs. When we talk about God, we're talking about someone who's, yet again, beyond the universe. So if God is the creator of space and time, that means that God holds ultimate authority over space and time. Why? Because he's the creator of it. The same way you, when you have a son or daughter, or if you have a son or daughter, you are held, you are given authority over your son or daughter, over your offspring. When you own a house, you are given authority over a house. In the same way that God, the creator, is given authority over the universe, right? And he's not bound by it because he is the creator of it. So we have God's authority, correct? So with God's authority, remember, word connects with authority. Words and authority are connected together. Why? Because authority gives words power, correct? And here's the thing. Now, let's go into scripture. Let's go into John 1, which is pretty exciting, right? Look at John 1. And I'm going to use my notebook because I want to make sure that I'm clear. That's where you're going to see some shots back and forth with this, right? So, in the beginning was the word. But here's the thing, not only was the word with God, the word was God. So if God is the ultimate authority, that means that that word is also the ultimate authority. Because not only was that word with God, it was God. Now here's the thing, when John is writing the scripture, and if you notice in the gospel, the word is capitalized. And in our English language, when we capitalize a word, we're talking about a proper noun. We're talking about a thing, right? We're not just talking about an object. We're talking about a thing, a proper noun, a person, place, thing, animal, right? That's what a noun is, right? I don't know. I took English like five times. I don't even know what my own language is, right? So word in itself is capitalized. So here's the thing. John then clarifies and says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word was Jesus Christ. That word was Jesus. And Jesus became flesh. And guess what? That authority, that word, that authority became flesh. And that's what's really cool. Because the word, God's word is so powerful that it incarnated, it incarnated itself into flesh. That's cool. It, it, it turned the metaphysical into the physical philosophy talk i'm sorry you know it surpasses the comprehension of the mind even even in itself it it, it surpasses the logic of physics it breaks the laws of physics right because god is not bound by by the laws of physics because he is the creator of said physics in itself so god's word notice how the word and god are the same but yet John draws a distinction between God and the Word. What it means is that Jesus is come substantial with the Father. It means that Jesus and God are both of the same substance, right? So why is this important? And what are some examples of this? What are some examples of God authority, of God's Word, speaking stuff into action or changing our reality? 
Look at Genesis. Look at the creation story. God doesn't have to move things. God speaks into action and it and it happens. Let there be light. There's light. Let there be darkness. There's darkness. You know, let there be birds of the sea and uh, birds of the sea. Let there be birds in the air and fish in the sea, right? God's words is so powerful. He's able to put stuff into reality just by speaking it, right? When it came time to create Adam, it says, let us make him in our own image. Yet again, the word, the word was there. The word was not only in action, it was there at the same time. Hashtag come substantial with the father. I don't want to make this a thing. I just, I, I wrote it down and it seemed cool. What? Co hashtag come substantial with the father. Wow. That's a long hashtag. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. It, it, I'm not cool. I, I just... No, you're not. It's okay. Let's skip around to Jesus, right? Let's talk about Jesus. Jesus, his word, he's God, right? So his words have authority. He spoke demons out of people. His, his voice had so much authority, it was able to change what was going on within, right? Demon be gone, demon be silent. Uh, Lazarus raised, he was able to raise the dead through his voice, right? Through his authority, because Jesus had authority over the world because his words have authority, right? Lazarus, raised, right? On the cross, the good thief was forgiven of sin, right? And so much more examples that I have a list of here. But there's one thing that, you know, that kind of divides when, when we, that kind of divides Christian communities when we talk about this. So, let's teleport, let's go. We're gonna go? At the time he was betrayed, he entered willingly into his passion. He took bread, gave me thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. We hear this all the time in Mass, and if you haven't been to Mass or you haven't been to Mass in a while, this is proclaimed every single Mass. And these words hold so much significance. Why? Because of the authority figure who said the words. Remember, Jesus is the Word made flesh. Jesus is God, right? So, remember, let there be light. There was light. Lazarus rise, Lazarus rose. This is my body. When Jesus takes the bread and he says, this is my body, his words have so much authority that it transubstantiates. It's called transubstantiation. And in transubstantiation, the bread becomes the body of Christ. It transubstantiates. Now here's the misconception about it. We think that transubstantiation means that the bread that we get, that, it, that we literally see it as flesh and we literally see it as blood, which is true. But if you were to take the bread and you were to take the wine under the microscope, it would still look the same. Right? But here's the thing, in philosophy, we must distinguish between the accidents and the substance. For the accident stays the same, the bread and wine, but the substance changes, right? That's why we get transubstantiation, the change in substance. The bread and wine become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus while remaining in its accidental form, while remaining body, while remaining bread and wine, right? So, a belief in the Eucharist is necessary in order to believe in the authority of God. Because if Jesus Christ's word has power, it means that whatever he says changes things. So when Jesus Christ says, this is my body, that means that the bread becomes his body. When Jesus Christ says, this is my blood, that means that the wine that was once wine, fruit of the earth and work of human hands, becomes the blood of our Savior, the blood of God, the blood of the Word made flesh.
Do this in memory of me. We might say that, okay, so we can accept it that at the Last Supper, the bread became his flesh and the wine became his blood. But how is it that it can appear right now in the, under this tabernacle, in this tabernacle, in this altar, every single mass? Well, here's the funny part about it. If you look in the end, do this in memory of me. It wasn't in a sense that, okay, this, you know, it was in a sense that this is how you're going to remember me. Not that this was going to be symbolic. No, I want you to do what I'm doing now, turning bread and wine into the body, into my body and my blood. I want you to do what I'm doing right now in memory of me. That's what it means. It's not just a necessary, it's not just a memory. Now, it's a reality. Now, the apostles are given the authority to be able to make this into a reality. And that's the, one of the most important parts about this, is that they're able to do that. It's that God gives them the, the authority to do it. That's why we're able to have priests, and they're able to do this, and they're able to have this power to do this. It's amazing. You see, even the one full of grace, as the angel Gabriel pronounced to our mother, our Virgin Mary, right? Our mother Mary. Even she knew the power of the word because before the angel departed, she said this, and this is Luke chapter one, verse 38. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Even Mother Mary knew the power of the word because the word was about to become flesh in her. The word, the word is so powerful. Not only the words of the world, but right now we're talking about the word, the capital W word. The word made flesh. So much so that it's able to change the world. Now, guys, God is able to change our lives. Why? Because he in himself is not bound by our own weakness. God is beyond our own sensible you know, thinking of reality. So if God wants something in your life, he's able to change it. Why? Because his words, right? Think about it. God told them, God told the apostles, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit and he gave them the right to forgive and to retain sin. He gave the authority, the word authority to the apostles. And the same way he gave the authority, the word authority, to be able to change bread and wine to the body, blood, soul, and divinity. Word has, words have actions, words have authority. And when it's coming from God, it is the, most, it is the supreme authority. So if God wants something for you in your life, listen. If you feel like God is calling you to do something, work towards it, make it happen. Because remember, if God is with you, then who is against you? If God is the almighty word made flesh, if God's word is able to change reality, can you imagine what he can do with your life? If you trust in him and you believe in him and you let him do what he has to do.